buenos días a todas, a todos. Eh, good morning and good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Mauro Cabrera Greenspan. I'm the executive director of Gate, and I welcome you to this virtual conversation on anti-gender movements and their current impact on trans <clears throat> on trans organizing around the world. We hope to continue this, this practice of meeting to build collective understandings and resistance over the next, the next year. So we really appreciate all of you to join us um, in this first uh, conversation. We are joined uh, today by a wonderful group of activists and, and researchers. So <clears throat> I will ask them to introduce themselves in this first round of intro introductions. Bogi, will you, will you introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Bogi, Bogi Fedorko. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm currently based in Budapest, Hungary. Um, institutional affiliations, I don't have many, but I have been working quite extensively with uh, different organizations, especially INGOs in the past uh, decade, primarily on community-based research, advocacy, and campaigning uh, with feminist, women's rights, LGBTI, and, and trans organizations, so mainly grassroots community organizations. And I also have been working with Gates in the past couple of months on mapping anti-gender actors, whether religious, nationalistic, or conservative actors in the Central, Eastern, European, and Central Asian region. Um, and just uh, one sentence about the importance of that. I think uh, it is very important to pay attention to this region because uh, Central, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia in my opinion, are increasingly viewed by international anti-gender activists as new battlegrounds for the defense of traditional or family values in quotation marks. Uh, so what we can observe here is a growing anti-gender discourse, which are uh, embedded in trends of de-democratization uh, as well. So I will talk a, a little bit, bit about um, the, this region and, and what's happening recently. Thank you very much, uh, Bogi. Chamindra, can I move uh, to you now? Well, certainly, Mauro. Um, thank you very much for having me here and apologies for the um, slight um, delay there to uh, get on the call. Um, it is a pleasure to uh, be part of this space and um, thank you once again. My name is Chamindra and I am Sri Lankan and my pronouns are she and her. Uh, and uh, my uh, work focuses on um, the sector of international human rights advocacy at the minute. And I uh, work with ILGA World as the senior officer uh, in the gender identity and expression and sex characteristics program. And uh, prior to that, I have uh, been working in grassroots organizing and also in the uh, academic uh, spheres in a couple of different places. Um, and today um, it's uh, early morning, uh, my local time, I'm joining here from the traditional territories of the coast, Salish people in uh, Lake Wungan territory uh, on the Pacific coast of Turtle Island. And um, this is indeed a uh, challenging, a difficult topic for many of us to engage with, but a necessary topic to engage with. And uh, thank you, Mauro, and thank you, Geert, for creating this platform, uh, which is an essential uh, platform uh, to uh, the advancement, not only, I think, of trans rights, but also um, global human rights in general. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chamindra, and thank you very much, um, Ilga. And I'm going to, to give the, the floor to Leo in, in a moment. Thank you very much, uh, TGU, 
for co-sponsoring this um, this event. We also had the the support of other two allied uh, organizations. One is Akahata, and the other is Sexuality Policy Policy Watch. So, and thank you very much, Amindra, for joining, being so early for. Uh, for you. I promise that the next time we're going to have an event that works in your in your uh, in your um, uh, time zone. So please, Leo, we'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Mauro, for, for having us here today. Uh, my name is Leo Mulio. I am a policy officer in Transgender Europe to GU, which is the regional organization, the, the trans umbrella organization working in Europe and Central Asia. And I couldn't agree more with Chamindra when uh, when talking about the need for this conversation, it is unfortunate that we have to to have this conversation, but it is indeed uh, very needed at this point. So I'm I'm happy that we can we can be having this this chance. So thank you for thank you, Gate, for for the initiative. I I would say like it's our pleasure, except that anti-gender movements are one of the worst topics uh, ever. And I don't want to take um, a lot of time in the conversation uh, to, frame, uh, to frame them. Look into the list of participants. We can see that most of the people attending are people that are already engaging in the work on, on anti-gender organizing. I just want, I consider necessary to explain a couple of things. Uh, some people have asked us why we focus on anti-gender and not, for example, on gender ideology. And actually, when GATE started um, this program of work, we call it gender ideology. And actually, still, when we refer to some of the consultancies, like the one that, for example, Boggy is, is doing with us, we tend to call them the gender ideology uh, consultancies because at the beginning, let's say two years, uh, two years ago, um, we saw gender ideology to be the, the best way of naming <clears throat> the opposition, the opposition to women's rights, the opposition to LGBTI rights, and also the opposition to trans rights. Considering that gender ideology is the name of a very dangerous conspiracy theory, according to what all of them are part of this huge and very well-funded tax force that have the mission of destroying the tra traditional values, including uh, the traditional uh, family, heterosexuality, and, and religion. Um, in that sense, gender, gender um, ideology has been used as, um, as, the, as, a, as a rhetorical and political device by, um, for example, the Catholic uh, Church and other, other churches and political parties <clears throat> and movements in the far right. I'm, I'm sorry. <clears throat> But at some point in the process, we find out that it's not, it was not enough to talk only about, <coughs> sorry, gender ideology and this conservative side of the opposition uh, to trans rights. But we were also seeing other form of opposition that was no talking about gender ideology, that was opposing to gender and to gender theory and to queer theory, and that we call genderism or queerism, and having different kinds of arguments, and that were in some cases were exactly the same. Basically, that the language of gender is putting sex and sexual and sexual uh, difference at, at risk. But also the, the idea that trans people are not um, attacking traditional values and traditional families and traditional, the traditional sex division and, and uh, sex roles, but actually that we are enforcing them and that we are part of a different conspiracy. Uh, and this conspiracy is targeting women and targeting feminism and targeting reproductive and sexual and sexual rights. And, and we are targeting emancipation from sex constrictions. So 
we decided to start working on these two forms of the opposition, talking about conservative anti-gender movements and radical anti-gender movements, considering conservative ones, those associated with the far rights and different religious and, and political groups, and talking about radical anti-gender movements to talk about movements integrated, for example, by um, anti-trans radical uh, feminist, by LGB anti-trans groups like the LGB Alliance, for example, but also about a process happening in some countries and Spain is, is one of them, for example, we have other examples in, in Brazil, of politicians on the left uh, wing of the political spectrum and uh, having an anti-gender and anti-trans agenda. And that's why we keep talking about anti-gender movements in general, trying to encompass the opposition. And we believe that it's really necessary to do that because what we see in our allies, and this is one of the key rationales about why having a trans conversation on anti-gender movements is that many of our allies coming from feminist organizations, from mainstream LGTBI uh, organizations, from human rights organizations, and even from donors, they are focused in the conservative and the gender movements. They are focused on the opposition to gender ideology and not to the opposition to gender theory, for example. And what is happening is that the case of the trans movement, we are finding ourselves trapped in different regions between these two dangers anti-gender movements coming from the right and anti-gender movements coming from the left. And what happened with it, with the anti-gender movements that are focused on the radical opposition or in the oppositions driven by the left, is they are specifically anti-trans. So what we see from the conservative side of the spectrum is that the opposition is divided and we have different targets or they have different targets. They are targeted women, they are targeting reproductive and sexual rights, they are targeting LGTBI groups, they are targeting sex work, targeting sex workers, and also people trying to get access to surrogacy. In the case of radical anti-gender movements, they have a clear target against trans people. We are not the only target. They are targeting other groups, including, for example, sex workers. But what we are seeing is a continuous advancement against um, the human rights of trans people in different countries. So that's why we believe that it's really urgent to have start having these conversations to strategize about how our movement can produce knowledge and political tactics to face and defeat anti-gender movements. So we are missing today, I forgot, I didn't mention that, we are missing uh, today the representative for mermaids from the UK that couldn't, that couldn't attend. And, but we hope to have a different webinar focus in the UK, which is right now the center of the radical anti-gender galaxy in the world with the competition of other countries, including a bit of Spain, a bit of Mexico, but it's getting, you know, it's right at the center of that of that position. So to continue the the conversation, I would like our, our panelists to start um, commenting <clears throat> how are anti-gender movements, conservative radical of both, sorry, um, acting in your regions or in the context where you are, when you are uh, working. And in that, um, in this case, I will ask uh, Leo to start if that's, if that's possible. Yeah, um, well, I was gonna say a lot of what you've said already. So I'll try to add some new things. Um, yeah, for me, I think it's very important to see how um, that, that division that you, uh, very well explained about the right, the far right, religious groups, and also the left, and also specifically on the left, talking about feminist groups. Um, even though another difference in the in this left side would also be that the left is divided in that sense. While probably when we talk about more of the conservative side, they're very um, 
they all agree, the whole, the whole party, the whole group agrees on this, and we're seeing a lot of division and conflict inside the, the leftist groups that are, um, in which some, some, some people are uh, using this anti-trans argument or uh, really working towards against, against trans people. Um, but I think strategically, it is important to, to see them as uh, part of the same movement, like you're saying, at, at the end of the day, it's targeting trans people. Um, again, uh, like you were, you were mentioning, uh, when we talk about more about the conservative side, we're seeing that the targets are multiple and that uh, it's not only about trans people, but when we see, when we look at the left, it's clearly targeting uh, trans people uh, mainly. So um, we also see that it depends on the national context. The way they do it is differently. Their strategies might be a bit different. But we also see that there is a general trend in the strategy and the arguments, um, both within each of the sites and also in common with, with the two of them. So in, in our case, we're looking more at the big picture on how they're working, how they're organizing, uh, what they have in common as well. Um, and they do have a lot in common, even though they come from very different places, they're uh, fighting for very different things. But at the end of the day, when it comes to trans people and trans people's rights, their arguments are basically the same and the goal, what they're uh, trying to achieve is the same. Um, so that's also why I think it's very important to see the, the commonalities um, so that we can think about how to, to counter them. In that sense, another, uh, thing that I think we've also been been discussing about the topic is this uh, concept of like you were you were saying what what is really anti-gender what fits within the anti-gender concept and, and, and movement and also another concept I think that we've been discussing about the topic is uh, it's a backlash is it really a backlash or is it something that's organized that is proactive and so we'll also have the discussion and seeing how really there is a very strong network uh, it, it is really well funded uh, it's not a, a mere uh, reaction to what's happening or to progressive movement, but rather something that comes uh, that is more thought through. Um, so it's it's much more proactive than than we would think. And I wonder if also trying to put it as a backlash is also part of the strategy because uh, it gives the kind of the feeling that they're reacting to something we're doing to society as trans activists um, instead of uh, not putting the focus on them and what they're actually doing to us. Um, so, um, thinking about the, the arguments, um, again, the language they might use, we see that might be different from when we talk about the right or the left, um, but the ideas really are the same. For example, in the, in the, in the right, we might hear them refer to us as the trans elite, the trans lobby, uh, gender ideology, you know, like this group of, of people that are taking over the world that are imposing their, their trans agenda. Uh, so the language might be a bit different, but at the end of the day, also when we when we hear about the, the left, it's it's kind of the same idea that trans people uh, have the power that we are uh, harming society. Um, it's true that when looking at the left, it's um, who is placed on the in the victim role is more women, uh, right? So that's kind of the the victim they've chosen to to put us as the, the aggressors or the um, the ones harming while uh, on the on the right or religious movements might be more on on society in general traditional values again so uh, ordinary citizens that were just um, harming so much and making suffer um, so I think the the strategy at the end of the day is the same of, of causing um, panic of, of uh, using fear um, and it works really well because fear works, right? Well, we've seen it in politics for a long time and many different areas and, and fields and it, and it works. And when it comes to trans people, I mean, transphobia is there. So it's very easy to just reinforce something that's already there. So of course, that's gonna, that's gonna work really well. Um, and then placing themselves as the victims, as the good ones, us as the, the, the bad person uh, that's putting everyone in danger. It's also it's also part of the strategy. Also, when when they talk about this as if it was a de a debate or a discussion that happens a lot with with feminist groups talking about no, we have to you know we have to discuss this uh, like if it was just a, an, an exchange of opinion uh, instead of a matter of, of human rights and them 
uh, targeting our, our human rights, or when, when some groups may talk about freedom of expression, for example, um, or by, by saying they have the truth, uh, it, whether it's nature's truth, God's truth, or science's uh, truth, um, it's, it's another argument they use. And, and they also do make a lot of noise. I think something we also talk a lot about is that um, at least on the left, it's, there are not that many people, uh, but they make us everyone believe that there's so many, right? Because I mean, they are powerful. They are people that are in, in very powerful positions, uh, feminist groups that uh, are very well known or that are part of uh, political parties that are very, very popular. So uh, they do make a lot of noise and that's, that's also working very well for them. Um, and another strategy that I would uh, highlight is how uh, they dehumanize us uh, by using this terminology of gender ideology that no one really knows what it means, but it scares you, right? When you hear gender ideology, gender theory, Spain, they also talk about queer, no, uh, queer movement or queer theory, as if trans people were the same as queer theory. So we're not even, we're not even people. We're not even a movement, which is a theory, right? So that's also part of of what they're trying to do. And uh, for all of those reasons, those arguments, I mean, they're uh, very thought through. They're they're really good in what they do. Um, also because they're, I mean, they're professionals in this. They they have funding. They have a lot of resources. Um, and I think that's something that really supports them is that they have social le legitimacy. I mean, uh, who's going to be more credible to society, this trans activist or, <laughs> or this super powerful person in some uh, of the biggest political party in a country? So that's, uh, of course, into their, to their advantage as well. So thank you very much, uh, Leon. I'm going to move to, to Chamindra to see how she sees this, this, uh, this very common combination between you know, a, a population at risk, like trans people being presented as actually the group of people putting other people in in danger and something that we have noticed once and again in different in different countries and in different languages is how some the same rhetoric for example which is anti-migrant or just plainly racist is put at work when it comes to be about discussing if people are going to be safe when trans people enter the room or if we are actually or it's really dangerous to have us sharing a uh, public bathroom, going, practicing the same, the same sports. So whenever you are ready, Chamindra, we would love to hear your, your opinion on how anti-gender movements are working in your, in your region. Thank you, Amaro. Um, yeah, so I think yourself, Mauro, and Leo have been very comprehensive in those uh, two um, statements. And I will try to complement some of the key points that were mentioned there. And I would say in particular, from an international human rights advocacy perspective, one uh, point that we can observe is that um, these reactionary movements, I mean, you have to call, call the state by the state, right? There's no point in calling it an agricultural instrument. So they, these reactionary movements have made their way to certain international platforms, which is a cause for concern. For example, uh, at the 37th session of the Universal Periodic Review of the Human Rights Council, they... Um, uh, official report of the United Nations of the Australian stakeholders submission includes for the first time, this reactionary anti-gender groups. Um, and um, we can, um, so that is a very recent example. And we can also notice gradually over the last uh, few months or the last couple of years, uh, the presence of these groups on international platforms, on important international platforms. So it can be the United Nations Human Rights Council, the Geneva-based UN system, or in New York, uh, they are um, closer to the UN General Assembly and important events and so on and so forth. Um, uh, organizations led by such reactionary groups um, making their way to these platforms. So that is uh, something we need to be conscious of because um, their presence in such places can influence policy 
on on one side and international how the international human rights apparatus um, uh, reacts towards uh, the rights of um, uh, people of all gender identities uh, from different parts of the world and also um, uh, and, and it gives them a platform. It, uh, it helps enhance the presence in such spaces, helps enhance their rhetoric. And, um, and it is also their presence in such spaces is very uh, dangerous to trans people, um, to um, uh, non-cis people of all gender identities, um, especially to indigenous people whose gender identities are specific to their own uh, uh, backgrounds and, and cultural contexts and so on. So this is an aspect where we all need to uh, be uh, very conscious of in terms of um, strategizing and mobilizing uh, our work. And uh, in the most recent past, we have noticed also that um, these groups try to uh, find increased kind of headway to UN mandates that are specifically meant to the protection of uh, trans rights, of the rights of uh, non-cis people or non-cis normative people. Uh, and uh, there is a quite a worrying development that we uh, collectively need to challenge uh, in terms of um, ensuring that uh, international human rights mechanisms um, continue to serve the original, the purposes, the very purposes of uh, those mechanisms. Uh, so that is one key point I would mention, and Mauro and Leo have been very comprehensive. So one point that I would add is that in when you say when Mauro mentioned my region, I come from the South Asian region, and in in this in that part of the world, I would say um, to contextualize this in a in a, in a kind of a historical context uh, with successive forms of Western uh, colonialism, uh, the most powerful um, uh, Western colonial force in that part of the world were the British. And one of the first uh, demographics, one of the first communities that the British took issue with, especially in the Indian subcontinent, were non cisnormative people. So especially um, People, um, people whose gender identity uh, or gender expression did not correspond to their gender assigned at birth, or um, people who would not fit in the box of that uh, clearly defined gender binary of Victorian Britain. And um, lots of uh, ordinances of colonial times, we can think of that were specifically intended at um, at, at reducing the social status of um, in the Bharatiya context of Hijra women, for instance, and um, and and challenging the presence the, in in public life of non cis normative people. So it was a it was a strategy of colonizing. Where I come from in Sri Lanka, uh, there are explicit accounts of the time when the British arrived, where. Um, uh, some accounts say that it was difficult to distinguish between men folk and women folk as such from the British perspective, where people would grow long hair, for instance, diff different forms of uh, being that were not corresponding to uh, that Victorian ideal. Those things were very highly suppressed. So one point there is that um, these these reactionary views, irrespective of where they come from. So because Mauro highlighted very well that these things come from different places, from very conservative um, faith-based sectors and also from certain elements of the left and so on. One thing common in a common thread that one, um, apologies, that uh, those, those reactionary groups is the fact that take any example of any country, they tend to attack the most vulnerable, like in the United Kingdom today, for instance. So um, they, the, a major target of their attacks are in fact little children, babies, trans children, right? So they take issue with, uh, they don't take issue with uh, trans people who have uh, prevailed, who have gone through a lot of challenges and who have asserted their uh, position in society and who are very articulate and um, who um, wield a certain level of agency. No, they target children 
who uh, are gender non-conforming or whose gender identities or expressions may not correspond to what was assigned at birth. So we see that on the left constantly and certain social media platforms have become spaces of uh, abject hatred. And um, one thing uh, that I kind of, a, because I started you know, contextualizing this um, historically is that given this part of the world where I am in, British colonialism in North America, in these territories, indigenous, sovereign indigenous territories we know as Canada, one of the early colonizing strategies was also attacking children in indigenous communities by creating these structures called residential schools. So your indigenous community is here in present day British Columbia. They take the children far away to Alberta or wherever else, to other territories, to Blackfoot territory and so on. And the residential school was very much a gender segregated school. So uh, gender segregated with the uh, children assigned male at birth, their hair cut and so on and so forth. The children assigned female at birth, put into a separate section. And it was to mold this society, to create a new society based on those Victorian values. So grabbing the children away from the parents. It was also a strategy implemented at um, uh, completely destroying the patterns of gender plurality, the different approaches to family, and to, because indigenous communities don't have the same notions of this nuclear family that um, exists in, that used to exist or that still exists for, uh, in, in, in Victorian Britain. Um, so to break those structures of gender plurality, of those traditions of, of different approaches to family and, and, and different value systems to break those completely. So you can see present day manifestations of those things. Uh, and uh, when, um, when a child is having any issue, whether it's, uh, it's, it's the seasonal flu or anything else, um, or a displeasure at school or an act of bullying or whatever it is, the primary people concerned are the child's family, right? Their parents and the guardians. So when people are trying to inform themselves and find solutions, uh, informed solutions to, um, to, to, to gender identity, gender expression issues in a very, very highly uh, cis-heteronormative world, um, it is to... Um, it is to it is to supportive parents and 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 uh, trans and queer children. I would say gender non-conforming children that they, they, they that they attack. So we need to be conscious of those realities. Okay. No, I was going to thank you and just to keep the the focus on children's and families for our next round when we can sure, come sure, back sure. Uh, to talk about the different trans communities being impacted. If that if that's Absolutely. okay for you, and I also Absolutely. want to to thank you not only for the international uh, analysis on what's going on with with the different special procedures at the at the UN but on, on colonialism and the colonialism as contest, contested at, at terms right now. And I'm thinking like in some regions, and, and I think that's a good way of starting with yours, uh, Bogi, what we are seeing is that on one, on one hand, trans people are being accused of colonizing spaces or even colonizing women's bodies. And at the same time, we see that the opposition, for example, the opposition on the left, or even, for example, in the case of Latin America, uh, the colonial femi feminism considered that, that trans people and gender, the entire language of gender, is a form of colonialism in, imposed for the World Monetary Fund or from international international development agencies into the third world. So they believe that anti-gender movements is a way of resisting colonialism. In a way or another, the, the, the world in itself is becoming a battleground. So I will give the floor uh, to Bogi now to talk about the situation in Central, in Central Europe. Yeah, I, I will talk a little bit about uh, language around, uh, you know, anti-gender actors. I, I, I think it's important. And I think that, you know, there is not much difference in the use of language, whether it's the conservative actors or the radical actors. So uh, what we can observe in this region, Central Eastern Europe, Central Asia, is that, uh, yeah, the concept of gender is uh, totally demonized and various actors 
um, are, are, are using this demonization in, in their campaigning. And just, I don't know how it is in, in other parts of the world, but uh, we also have to be aware that uh, uh, gender does not really exist as a separate expression in many languages of the region. So that even gives it more, more significance. So, you know, people can use it more to discredit activists who are working around gender equality issues and to further demonize the, the concept. Um, but also, I will come back to this, this uh, colonial, anti-colonial, decolon decolonial activism and, and, you know, like wrapping uh, all these anti-gender activism in, in this language is very significant in, in this reason, um, in, in this region. But before going in, into that, I just wanted to give you a little bit of overview of, you know, um, the, the history uh, the political cultural context from the from the region because I'm not not sure if everyone is familiar of you know like how how the discourse has been shaping here. So the whole region we are talking about Central Eastern Europe, Central Asia is a very heterogeneous one with diverging historical, political, cultural context, but all countries share in common uh, so Soviet or former Eastern Bloc legacy. So that is still determining um, up until today, even though countries have undergone decades of transition from the Soviet model of political and economic systems to more less or more democratic and markets, market oriented societies in the past past decades. Uh, and when we talk about uh, transphobia, intersex phobia, or any kind of negative attitudes towards LGBTI communities, we also have to go back to the Soviet Union and its state sponsored homophobia, transphobia, LGBT phobia, um, and also the legacy that that it gives societies today. So for those of you who don't know too much about the region, um, the, the current laws that impact transgender diverse and intersex people uh, are very strongly influenced by the Soviet pathologizing tradition of treating LGBTI people who were frequently arrested based on criminalization provision, uh, provisions in the Soviet Union and were even placed in psychiatric hospitals. Uh, frequent diagnosis was uh, schizophrenia. Um, and uh, this uh, still has relevance, uh, unfortunately, today. This uh, very strong pathologizing tradition continues. And most of the countries in the region require abusive, invasive, humiliating procedures in order to change one's gender in official documents. And a lot of countries still require, unfortunately, sterilization as a prerequisite to legal gender recognition. Um, so this is what we are dealing with in terms of the situation for uh, trans and intersex people and uh, how the situation has shifted since uh, 1980, 89 and 1980. Uh, 90 uh, is quite significant, I think, because as you can see in the in the communist socialist era, basically there was attempts to systematically erase LGBT identities from any kind of discourse with quite strong criminalization. But after the fall of, uh, of the communist system in the 1990s and early 2000s, uh, there was a, a different period starting. And I would say this was a period of increased visibility for LGBT activism. Um, this was, of course, facilitated by the collapse of the authoritarian, authoritarian regimes before. And um, in the two, from the 2000s on, we can see that governments are more and more committed to democratization, integration processes, and they also have to align with uh, European institutions such as the European Union and also the Council of Europe. So uh, why I'm mentioning all of this uh, is because, uh, and going back to what Shamindra was saying, this uh, language around colonization and uh, anti-colonial efforts or decolonial, as a lot of actors are calling them here in this region. Um, now, this is coming uh, up a lot, I think, and not only trans people or intersex people are viewed as colonizers, but also these institutions who are promoting gender equality. So the European Union and the Council of Europe. And this takes us uh, to the rhetorics of these anti-gender actors in, in the region. Uh, so I think there is some specificities um, in Central Eastern Europe and Central Asia. 
Um, so everything links back to the Soviet uh, state socialist structures and an opposition to, to those. That's why in a lot of campaigns, anti-gender campaigns, we can hear about gender ideology or gender theory or genderism or whatever name, you know, whatever actors come up with, uh, defined as a new form of total totalitarianism, a new form of Marxism, a new form of fascism. So I think it, it's very common in the region. And especially this year, we have heard a lot of arguments like this uh, from Poland or Hungary, which uh, implemented uh, uh, certain restrictions on women's rights and reproductive rights and also um, trans rights, unfortunately. And I think, again, about this um, uh, argumentation around uh, colonialism. Um, so very much uh, uh, we hear that uh, these theories of uh, trans uh, activists or gender equality activists are promoted by a global uh, elite of Western activists governments and even funders. I'm sure uh, a lot of you have been hearing about the Open Society Foundations and the, and the mock, uh, mocking campaign of the government and very anti-Semitic campaign of the government as well here in, in Hungary against uh, George Soros. So just being here in Budapest, you know, every day you can hear um, a new news, news item uh, which is trying to, from the government, which is trying to discredit George Soros, who is of Hungarian origin. Um, and um, and uh, basically depicts the opposition to the government as the agents of, of George Soros. Uh, so yeah, so they say, you know, uh, trans activism or gender equality ex activism is basically exporting uh, Western decadent values to the East and also advancing foreign often economic interests. And um, yeah, what we often hear is also that the true objectives of uh, trans activists, gender equality acti activists are only packaged in equality and human rights language just to deceive the public, the wider public. Uh, otherwise their true objective is to seize power and impose deviant values on the average uh, citizens. Um, and of course, uh, there is very much an interconnectedness, at least from the conservative actors between uh, trans rights and the wider LGBT rights and women's rights. So how activists are depicted is uh, being threats to traditional family models and the natural or, or order. So I think this is a uh, very specific in, in terms of like campaigning, uh, mainly from conservative actors, but some of the arguments are also used from the left, from, from radical actors. I think one thing, um, uh, Chamindra and Lao and Mauro, you have mentioned so much, so I'm not gonna go into details about a lot of topics, but I think one thing uh, besides what Lao mentioned that uh, this uh, you know, uh, backlash concept might not be that much to our benefit in analyzing is, uh, the whole whole concept and the whole you know like events or, um, by anti-gender actors is the the role of Russia. So I often also hear that you know like Russia is orchestrating the whole anti-gender movement and um, everything around it. Uh, I think we have to acknowledge that Russia has a very important role and a lot, lot of anti-gender campaigns in various countries of the regions are directly engineered from the Kremlin, from the Russian parliament, also with a wide support from the Orthodox Church of Russia, but that is not the solely determining uh, uh, factor here, I think. So if you take the take a look at Ukraine as an example, for instance, we see huge, uh, huge uh, mobilization of anti-gender actors, even though the political alignment is, is not there. And that goes for other countries um, in, in the region uh, too. Um, and um, one, uh, just uh, to finish off uh, with, with one thing. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, there is increase, and I have been talking to a lot of trans and intersex activists in the past couple of months. There is an increasingly uh, vocal, uh, radical leftist opposition to to trans rights in particular. Uh, that is very true, but due to historical dynamics, they are not as close to policy making and decision making yet, as in, for instance, in a lot of Western European countries. Um, but what we can also observe is that uh, certain EU conventions, directives, or Council of Europe conventions can really quickly, you know, mobilize campaigning around 
certain issues. So one thing to mention uh, here is the Istanbul Convention, which is an uh, anti-gender violence convention uh, from 2011. And I think that gives a really good overview of how very diverse actors can come to get together uh, against gender or genderism or again whatever they are using and uh, not just governments which are right wing or extreme right wing but also you know sometimes leftist political parties i think it's rare in the region yet but it has happened so just to name one one uh, example in bulgaria for instance even the bulgarian socialist party uh, campaigned against the adoption and ratification of the of the um, Istanbul Convention. So we see that more and more leftist parties or um, civil society, including radical feminists or wider feminist organizations, they are you know joining on these campaigns initially uh, launched by by governments and and political actors. So I will leave it here, and I'm not going to talk about the financing. <laughs> Thank you very, thank you very much, um, Bohi. Before we start, like in a second round and, and opening to uh, to questions, we have very good contributions in the in the chat. I wanted to come back a bit about the issue of backlash. Something that is very interesting about about that is that in general, when people are talking, we're using backlash to explain what's going on. Usually the explanation, it, it includes like a theory of change, which is we are doing great advances and then the opposition is reacting. But it, that narrative doesn't work for trans people because in some cases, we never did those advances. So we're seeing anti-gender so-called backlash, even in countries that are, or that still have sterilization as a requirement. And in the case of Spain or in the case of the UK, we're seeing reactions coming from the radical anti-gender movement, even to the idea of improving trans people's situation, which means that it's not, as, as Leo was saying, it's not a backlash, it's a proactive, it's a proactive movement. And I don't have the, the answer for that. And maybe this, this call is too short to, re, you know, to distinguish. If we are talking about one movement, if we are talking about two movements, or if we are talking about just movements that can be extremely contradictory in the same way in which people, for example, can use science to be in favor or against uh, vaccines, they can use, you know, different perspectives to be uh, anti-gender and in particular um, anti-trans, which seems to be one of the key things that these different movements, and maybe they are incoherent, um, have in common. Um, we can explore the way in which they are they are uh, working or not or not uh, together, but. If we have a, a moment to have a, you know, to continue the, the conversation, I would really like to go back to the issue of the different populations being targeted. Because um, something that trans people know is that anti-trans organizing is not new. It's not new coming from uh, psychomedical science. It's not new coming from the far right or from different you know, institutionalized religions. And it's not new coming from feminists and it's not new coming from LGB uh, groups. It's just, it's getting stronger. And as Chamindra was saying, and, and maybe if that's okay, Chamindra, we can start with, with you. I don't want to put like in, in, the, in the spot on this. What we are seeing is that Anti-gender movements are coming from targeting trans women as extremely dangerous to women to targeting trans men describing us as um, young vulnerable women who have been forced by patriarchy to become men to targeting children and, and, and starting something that we are gay, at least we are describing as a war on, on children and mobilizing uh, energies coming from both the left and, and right to protect children from this uh, nightmare called transgenderism. 
uh, called gender theory or called uh, gender gender ideology. So I would really like to hear your your perspectives on on how anti-gender organizing uh, organizing is attacking our different uh, communities. I will be a bit stricter with the time so we can make sure that we have a bit of time for, for questions. So let's say between three and, and, and five minutes per intervention, that will be awesome. Absolutely, Maro. Um, apologies for the uh, going a bit, um, you know, being not very conscious of time there in the first round. Uh, so thank you, Mauro. Uh, and um, yes, so what we see there is, like you rightly said, Mauro, uh, you are absolutely spot on in the um, Australian stakeholders report that I mentioned, um, about at the 37th session of the UPR, the, um, the, there is a precise uh, reference to what Mauro just said, um, uh, referring to uh, the case in their language of um, young girls being groomed um, to, um, you know, to within inverted commas becoming trans as such, uh, which is um, which is an absolutely atrocious lie, and. Um, so one thing, one key point, I would say, I, I mentioned two points here. One key point is that we see um, these attacks on trans children uh, in, um, uh, in quite a few countries. And we see them coming from different places, like uh, the way uh, Bodhi said, uh, you know, um, the uh, far right wing or faith based groups, conservative faith based groups, and also from certain elements of, of, of the left. And so they come from different places, and the um, the worst effect I would say is in the uh, climate of um, um, this this climate of um, suspicion and um, fear that they help create in society uh, with this kind of uh, rhetoric, with this kind of language, uh, because we all know very well how challenging it is for young trans people to access care, irrespective of where we are in. And we also know very well that um, in places like the United Kingdom, uh, they still have these very strongly pathologizing policies for uh, trans healthcare. So going through those hurdles, it's a nightmare in its own right. And in countries like mine, Sri Lanka, uh, they, uh, because of certain historic connections, our healthcare sector, um, our public policy sector likes to look to the United Kingdom when they make policy decisions. And uh, we have also followed that pathologizing path, and um, which is which is very unfortunate. So my my key point there is that um, the the impact of this language can be very harmful to young trans people uh, who are who face a lot of major challenges in accessing even the basic forms of care. That's um, one key point. And then I would reiterate like this whole idea of like Mauro and Bodhi, both of you rightly said this idea of, you know, uh, uh, words like colonization or colonialism being claimed by uh, this, these reactionary groups. There again, it's very important for us to you know keep distinguishing between the advocacy for rights and um, and and the and and the advocacy for the rights of those who are who face systemic forms of marginalization and um, and this kind of hollow kind of discourse because forms of colonization have always targeted nonconformity to this uh, very uh, certain ideal of cis heteronormativity. So, and, and those forms of colonialism have always targeted the most vulnerable in society first. Um, and, and you get so many examples from so many different parts of the world. So um, the, um, it falls upon all of us to develop discourses, especially and um, uh, develop new strategies uh, towards you know protecting uh, young trans people and this is something I've been keeping on saying to my own younger self uh, when I think of the kind of language 
uh, I keep hearing and I'm saying to myself, okay, like today from where I stand, I could put things in perspective, but what if a um, young person, 14, 15 years old, or even younger, or even older, um, hears this, and how would they feel? And uh, that is where it is uh, very disconcerting, and where uh, dialogues of this nature are essential. On to you, over to you, Mara. Thank you very much, uh, Chavindra. Um, it's a very, we're in a very concerning, uh, <laughs> we're in a very concerning situation <laughs> right now. Um, Leo, what it, it, this this description? How it resonates with you and and, and TGU experiences uh, in in Europe? Uh, how are you seeing these these advances? Yeah, well, I think the um, the very clear example of of how this is happening is the the UK very recently, uh, the High Court in in England and Wales talking about how children uh, do not have the capacity to make decisions or. Uh, to be aware of who they are and, and make decisions about themselves um, with the consequence of uh, losing access to, to healthcare. Um, and when I was listening to, uh, to both of you, Maureen and Tamindra, I was thinking when you were talking about uh, this discourse around girls and convincing girls to become boys and all of this about, about trans masculine people, um, I was thinking about this argument that they use a lot about the transition, people detransitioning. And, and I had never thought about this before, but I just realized that most of the images that come to mind are uh, women that transition to, to men that then realize that we're actually women. Um, I can't remember so many examples of, of the opposite situation, which I find interesting. So yeah, I think there is there is something with that, with that discourse happening there. And I think one key element in this is, um, again, pathologization, so how we are uh, seeing the repathologization of trans people mm, and of course of, of children as well. And I agree that children are uh, one of the main targets um, and this idea of protecting children. So um, I think that's also one of the most, um, one of the strategies that has the most impact because people really empathize with how vulnerable children is, which at the same time, uh, we're, so we're talking about pathologization, we're talking about transphobia, but we're also talking here about ageism and how children um, also carry this intersection of, of being trans, but also being young. So they're not taking, um, uh, they don't, they're not giving any credibility. So in the, in this case, we see, we clearly see that it is the case for, for trans or gender diverse, diverse children not to be believed on, on who they are, which is already something that because of pathologization and transphobia happens to all people already. And I think just because also they're young and they're children, that's even re, reinforced uh, further. Um, so in that sense, I think um, it is it is very dangerous because we are we're seeing this pathologization, which is not only um, about um, diagnosis as such, which of course it is, and, and that's a big part of the work we do, but it's also about all the other areas of, of, of people's lives that are affected by pathologization. So we're talking about legal gender recognition, but also about to be respected in your school, to be respected in, in general healthcare. I mean, we're talking about all, all areas of, of people's lives, and in this case, children. So it is, it is very problematic the message that's sending to society that we cannot believe trans people, uh, that again, this is some kind of pathology that someone else has to assess and, and give a certificate that this person is really trans, because many people uh, regret at the end, right? This whole uh, pathologizing discourse is, is very dangerous. Thank you very much, um, Leo. And, and I want to, to, to add something to what you said. When we are talking about this, this sentence, this ruling in, from the UK about children not being able to make informed decisions, of course, you know, we can talk about children of minors, but actually what they said is that this is people uh, younger than 16. So we are not talking about a five years old making an informed decision, but we are talking about someone who is, for example, 15. And something that we are seeing about anti-gender movements targeting trans people is that they are committed to reducing autonomy and self-determination for other population as well. So for example, when the anti-gender opposition in the, in the UK and other parts of the world say, for example, 
that many young women are being transformed into men and that actually we need a, a diagnosis to be reestablished to do you know, a psychiatric assessment, they are not only talking about pathologizing trans people, they are talking about pathologizing uh, cis women as well. Or for example, when the LGB Alliance proposed in a public consultation with the independent expert on soggy issues from the UN, the possibility of excluding certain form of conversion therapies that they, they call a gentle interrogation of, of children who believe to be trans, to exclude that from the universal ban on conversion therapies, what they are saying is it's okay to pathologize all children. If you need a psychiatrist to distinguish who is trans and who is not, it basically means that anyone can be subjected to pathologization, but also to conversion to conversion therapies. So we are in an extremely dangerous moment to be to be a trans uh, a trans person. And what we are seeing, and and several of you have have mentioned that, is we are not talking about a lot of people, but we are talking about a few people with political power and power to to frame the international conversation. Of course, that for them we are even more powerful you know after all they believe that people like us in the conversation and organizations like ILGA and TGU and GATE and our allies plus some of our donors Soros uh, himself and the devil we all took over the World Health Organization and convinced them to depathologize trans people because actually uh, we have a very perverse agenda. Just yesterday, for example, um, a key and old feminist from from uh, Spain reiterated the, her her beliefs that trans people, but also homosexual people, are connected with the pedophile uh, movement. And again, we are not talking about someone who is a religious, you know, uh, a lady. We're talking about someone that was part of the resistance to the Franco dictatorship in Spain and who is an extreme left of the political spectrum. So in that sense, and, and again, anti-gender movements are attacking us from, from everywhere. Is that I'm going to go to turn to, to Bogi and ask you two questions instead of one. <laughs> Sorry, one, if you see in this kind of multi uh, targets, uh, the attacks that have multi targets in the region where you are, we are working. And also there is a question from, from San, and I'm going to start integrating the questions that we are getting into the conversation. And San Cham is asking if the conservative movement uh, in, in Eastern and Central Europe, so maybe uh, Leo, you can feel able to answer that well, if, if they ever see the radical movement as their allies, or they also see the opposition like trans people. So are they working together? Uh, do we have any idea if they are being funded by the same people? Um, what is your, your opinion on, on that? Um, yeah, first, I just wanted to reiterate, like you, you mentioned what is happening in the in the UK for a couple of years now, unfortunately, I think oftentimes we think that, you know, what, hap what happens in the country stays in the country, you know, with all, all the events, uh, anti-trans events in the past, past uh, year, especially. And uh, when I was talking to trans activists from across the region, you know, like what they mentioned is, that the, these anti-trans and anti-gender narrative is basically just the direct translation of what is going on in the UK. So it, it, it does not even get like, you know, contextualized by radical anti-trans uh, feminist or no, what is uh, you know, mainstream news in the UK that is setting the public discourse, you know, two days after in Poland or Kazakhstan or Hungary. So I think we often do not connect these things enough uh, and, and, and we should. And um, I, I don't wanna simplify, you know, East and West divisions or anything, uh, that's not my thing usually, but, you know, data and public opinion surveys show that the attitudes towards trans people 
are not the same as in a lot of Western European countries. So uh, it has historic reasons. I, I won't go into that. But I think uh, you know what is happening in the UK has to be analyzed in that context. You know how much acceptance trans and intersex people have in society generally, how much negative attitudes they face versus you know how much uh, negativity and very hostile attitudes people face in Kazakhstan or Ukraine or in Hungary. Um, so um, there, I think there is a discrepancy. So a tiny bit of, uh, of uh, anti-gender, anti-trans discourse has a much uh, faster direct impact on trans people. That's what I'm trying to, to say. So um, I just remember, and going back to the children topic uh, just for a second, uh, talking to activists from Poland who uh, were sharing a story with me about uh, parents taking their kids, trans kids, to the airport and posting on social media, you know, how they are sending them off to relatives in other countries because of the uh, increasing very hostile anti-trans rhetoric in the country. So that's what we are talking about, that you cannot let your child go, you know, out on the street because of fear of, uh, you know, attacks, potential attacks. So I felt very emotional by that. And I don't think that those people who are, you know, publishing a wealth of anti-trans material uh, in the UK, uh, in front of their laptop, think about, you know, this butterfly effect, like what that uh, creates in Poland uh, a week after and what that uh, contributes to. Sorry, I uh, wanted to talk about that. Uh, otherwise, about um, the targets, I, what I think we don't talk uh, often enough about is the connection between anti-migrant and racist rhetorics and anti-trans, uh, anti-gender rhetorics. And I think we should uh, talk more about that. Just to give you one example, it, it, it has come up with my discussion, in my discussions a lot. But for instance, the Hungarian government's rhetoric around the Istanbul Convention, this anti-gender violence, uh, gender-based violence convention, is uh, of course very transphobic uh, as well. But at the same time, parallelly to this, they also say that we, we're not going to ratify this convention because uh, this has a uh, very strict uh, migration asylum provisions based on uh, based on gender, for instance. So, you know, they, they all connect, I, I, I think, in a way. And uh, on anti-trans discourses can be, you know, or even like social media campaigns or whatever campaigns can be also very racist and, and uh, very sexist as, as well. So there is a larger connection in these narratives. To answer Zan's question about whether the radical radicals are bad fellows with the conservatives, I have not seen that often in this region. And that's again, historically, because uh, you know, any kind of like civil society, uh, they don't have uh, access to, to, to government and then policymaking, except for, you know, a few cases. But uh, I, I, I think it's in increasingly coming. And what um, they do together is ba basically setting the bigger narrative. Uh, so they might not work on, you know, specific campaigns together, but, you know, like creating the general discourse around trans communities and intersex communities. I think uh, they are in a, in a way aligned uh, with each other. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, Leo, please, please yeah, go ahead. A super, short, a super short comment on that. that um, what, I, what I've also seen is that I, I think the conservative part of our movement uses anti-trans feminist arguments to their own advantage. So I'm not sure how much or how they're actually working together but it is true that I think they are using more the, the right, the conservative side is using um, the arguments of the left as a way of also, again, like cleaning their image, see, uh, looking more progressive and also um, widening their audience. Because then if they also say things that some feminists are saying, right, that what, what else can give them a, a better, uh, more progressive look than than aligning in arguments with feminists. So I think that's that's part of their strategy as well, of gaining more uh, audience. And and I think we, we've seen that in in Spain, for example. Um, and we, we have also seen uh, actually I think it was Lidia Falcon, the person you mentioned, Mauro, who actually this uh, feminist um, who participated also in media events with 
radical uh, rights, um, extreme rights uh, actors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leo. And, and I wanted to come back to something that Yulia heard, like Ilga's director of program. Now we were talking, we, we talked time to time about, about these issues. And, and this is something to me that I believe that is very important. We need, like, we are living in a, in, in a moment where anyone can have a platform. Uh, to say something and people will repeat that and it doesn't matter you don't need to know a lot about something you can get traction it doesn't you just need to know how it works and that's where we are seeing my impression is that we like have like segments like ideological or political segments that can be attached or detached so a person can believe in one thing and and on on a different issue believe in completely the opposite thing so we used to believe that if you would like to call you progressive you should be a uh, pro choice pro women pro lgtbi pro different things anti capitalist and but at, at, right now you actually don't know so you can have someone who is um very religious from the left pro women uh, pro lgb against uh trans or you can see people who are in favor of trans people in general but not in favor of allowing uh, trans children to be recognized so we see that our political affiliations and our ideologies can be detached or reattached very easily and without any uh, coherent thought, which creates a lot of problems in different movements. I don't know if you, like the panelists, have had the chance of seeing all the questions that we have uh, got so far. And many of these questions have to do with the connection between the situations like trans people are facing with the situation faced by, for example, trans people in different countries. So this is something that we are noticing. Uh, that, that we start talking about one region and we have questions about what's going on here and what's going on there. Or what are you doing? For example, we have a question about what is happening in Sweden that have had processes similar to the UK, and, but they are not so visible. Or we have questions about other populations being affected. For example, we have a question saying, uh, wh what is happening with this you know, attacks against the possibility of autistic people to be recognized as trans people and getting access to transitional healthcare at the same time is only happening in the UK or is happening in other parts of the world. And I have bad news, it's happening in many places at the same time. So one, one of the key concerns is how our movement not only can strategize and and work together to confront anti-gender movements, but how we can build successful alliances with other communities and movement in a moment where it's almost impossible to know what people think about you know, um, several issues at the, same, at the same time. And the other thing, and we have a couple of questions about that has to do with the research agenda, which for me, and I'm sorry for being such a materialistic person, uh, the production of knowledge is strongly connecting, connect, uh, connected with the production of money <laughs> and to fund uh, research. So part of the problem that we have is not only the political opposition, but that our movements are not in the right place and time for getting the funding that, funding that we need uh, to be able to, um, to respond. Uh, before giving you the, the floor, and I think that we have like 10, 15 more minutes, Chaminda, I have a direct question for you and, and uh, Sonia Correa, um, who has spent her life uh, organizing against anti-gender and the gender movements wanted to know more if you can tell us uh, about the UPR mentioned that you the uh, attack that you mentioned like what country and what organization uh, has presented that report is um, is possible uh, certainly Mauro and uh... Thank you to uh, you know Sonia for all the um, uh, important work that uh, Sonia has been doing over the years as well. And um, bear with me a second. I will um, 
try to share the exact link to that. Uh, it is from the 37th session of the Universal Periodic Review, um, where the uh, when Australia uh, was being discussed. This is the Australian stakeholder submission where uh, certain anti-gender elements were were included in the um, in the uh, official report of the united nations so what they're saying is that um uh, they uh, there's this one paragraph where there's a reference to uh, the so-called use of harmful medical and surgical interventions for children who did not conform uh, to conform to sex stereotypes or were diagnosed with uh, gender dysphoria and so on. And um, again, once again, in the stakeholder submission, the emphasis here is largely on uh, uh, young AFA B people and uh, the uh, points that they're trying to put forward is that um like we like uh, quite a few of us mentioned during this event so far uh, that uh, the there is a certain kind of forceful uh, effort um, you know happening here uh, to um uh, to to uh, make young people um affirm their gender identities and expressions so um so the uh, stakeholders report there is this one sentence that is uh, uh, deeply problematic where they say that this suggests that the phenomenon is a result of social contagion rather than any cause um inherent uh, in the individual child so uh, it goes on like that and um it is indeed uh, like I said, deeply worrying that it has made its way that discourses of this nature are being recorded in official United Nations uh, documentation. So um, what I will do is I will try to uh, look for the, um, I will I'll get you the exact link to um, that, that submission in a, in a second. Thank you very much. Um, um... To me, and and you know something that is happening. We didn't have the chance of talking about that, and I hope that Kate and other partners can organize um, a call, you know, like a conversation like this to dis to discuss the impact of anti-gender organizing on inter the intersex movement. So I don't want to put Ilga on the spot, but we we can. I hope that we can work uh, together, together, you know, getting other intersex organizations to discuss this issue, because what Chamindra is mentioning, and we see that in different regions, is like intersex people like myself, we are being used as a weapon against trans people, and and the the and in that case, the advances that the trans movement uh sorry the intersex movement is doing saying you know uh, normalizing interventions uh, on intersex children must be banned some groups especially those in the radical sector of the movement are using that of the anti-gender movement sorry are using that argument to say well but you know um interventions such as puberty blockers or you know any support for trans and gender diverse children should be considered also normalizing interventions and but at the same time when they talk and in that sense there is a coincidence between the the right and the left uh, or conservatives and, and and radicals when they talk about sex as a binary they said and of course we have intersex people but but that uh intersex is not a real thing it's just a group of malformations so intersex people are being repathologized and and we're we're used against trans people's human rights especially against trans um, children um so ha have you seen that the dynamics in your in your own field of work boggy or leo i don't know who wants to go first um I did not particularly, uh, you know, study this aspect, but I have been having conversations with uh, with uh, groups around it. So my general feeling, if we can generalize this at all, is I absolutely agree that yeah, intersex people are usually and in communities are are uh, kind of like 
you know, made the, the exception. So this is the rhetoric around them. That, yeah, we are just ignoring intersex people because they, you know, from what, whatever side you're coming from, they're just like not, you know, filling in your world, worldview in, in a way. So we just put them, them aside. Um, what I would add uh, from, from this region uh, is that intersex organ organizing and, and movement uh, is very, very, you know, in its early stages, I think. Um, and I also think that uh, some, somehow uh, discourses around intersex issues have not fully, you know, entered public rounds of discussion. So uh, I, I wouldn't say there is a lot, a lot of, uh, you know, argumentation for, against, whatever direction around intersex issues in most of the countries of the of the region. Uh, and if intersex topics are are coming up, uh, you know, basically. They are not really going anywhere. It's just like put aside as if intersex people didn't exist or they did, don't feel your argumentation. So you're just like dropping the topic. So that's my limited understanding. I, I think we should uh, focus more more on it as well. Uh, but just as a you know basic basic idea. Leo. Yeah, for me it's very similar. Um, I think I think it will be part of the conversation. I think it's evolving and they're starting. Uh, to be more sophisticated also in their language and their arguments. So I think um, I think it could be there, but I think it's not it's not there yet. I don't think they're um, they've thought so much about it yet in order to to be that sophisticated. Um, and I, I do see more of that part of that Boogie was mentioning, more of the dismissal of, of intersex people. Um, yeah, because I, I think in a way it's still, um, attacks their their binary understanding of sex. That's what they're repeating constantly. So so in that sense, uh, it goes against it goes against their own argumentation. So I think they're um, at at least I see more of that part than the than the other of using it against trans children. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So before we because we are we are close to to end. And, and I will give the floor to, um, to Nathan of Connor, who is coordinating Gates um, Communications um, in, a, in a moment. I want, I want to, to explain and to apologize to some of the people that have asked really interesting questions. And that because this, this um, webinar is going to be published and, and or it's going to be released and it's going to be available not only to trans activists and our allies but also to the opposition there are strategic questions that we can discuss in public that has to do with tracking funding to identifying key players so in that sense what i will um recommend that people are interested in having those more like in-depth strategic discussions and interchanges of knowledge to contact um, us uh, personally, all the different organizations involved in, in this call to continue the conversation in a safe, safest um, platform. I, I really appreciate your understanding on, on this topic, but something that we are learning in this process is to be extremely uh, careful with um, the way in which we, design and implement or, or political strategies. If, if you are listening to this recording or participating right now, and you as an individual and your organizations want to be part of putting these uh, conversations together, please contact us. We are interested in involving as many partners and activists as, as possible and we know that part of the work that we need to do in terms of resisting anti-gender movements is to have um, transgender diverse and intersex voices heard out there. And, and for people to see us and, and to learn from, from us. So if you believe that you can uh, contribute um, to this process, please uh, contact us so we can start working together and, and planning for what to see. We're going to have 10 years of virtual conversations to cover every, <laughs> everything. So I want to come back to our speakers and, and to this very last question, which is about what we can ask 
to our seas uh, allies and, and, co and comrades, if you can ask something, uh, you know, from from them. So I was thinking I would, what, the first thing I would do is to, to raise awareness on, on how difficult it is to work on this for us as trans activists and trans people. Uh, I think it is important for them to know that this is, because I think we've mentioned the lack of funding, um, but I mean, it's not only about the funding, it's about how difficult it is to face this, to face structural transphobia every day in your life, and then uh, to have to do your work in, in activism uh, in general, to kind of defend our rights in so many areas, in so many situations, while also having this on top of everything else. So just to, to make it clear that we're really struggling to, to work on the topic. And then having said that, I would just ask you to get involved. We really, really need you. So think about the ways in which you can support, if you need to get in touch, if you need any kind of resources. Um, and something that I, I like asking is to, um, for people to also question themselves and their own ideas around gender, or around their identities. Uh, I think many times this seems like a very complex topic and people cis, uh, and allies get lost about, you know, I don't know how to use the right language. I don't know. I think if it, when everyone does the effort of actually thinking about their own gender identity, their own body, um, I mean, we have everything in common. So I think once that reflection is, is done, it is pretty straightforward to kind of uh, fight for the rights of everyone to make their own decisions about their bodies, to have their gender identity respected, and it just comes naturally. So I invite all of you to, to reflect about your own experience with gender. Thank you very much, Leo. Who wants to go first, Bogi, Chamindra? Bogi, okay. I can go as a cis person. <laughs> so uh, I, I just want to reiterate like what was going on in, in 2020, at least on this part of the world. I think uh, there was a lot of uh, solidarity within the trans community that I have been observing. You know, trans organizations reacted so quickly to the COVID-19 crisis and they did their best, like impossible, you know, beyond imagination, like uh, distributing relief, helping people access medical care. And uh, somehow I did not see much of, you know, feminist or even LGB solidarity in, in these actions, whether, you know, just like sharing resources or contributing financially or whatever. So I, I, I think that definitely has to you know get better as as soon as possible especially in context like i did not mention this uh, during this talk but uh, i think there has been a uh, minimum five legislative attacks against trans people in 2020 in eastern europe uh, including hungary romania kazakhstan and poland and I don't know which one was the fifth on my, my list. And uh, what I saw here uh, in Hungary, that basically there was no, you know, pro I know that protests were not allowed during COVID-19, but even online, you know, this was such a marginal issue. And uh, uh, yeah, th th there was hardly any, any support or platforms given to trans activists to at least oppose, um, you know, this, this ideology behind the law lawmaking. So I, I think sharing platforms and, and resources as much as possible, that has really has to start uh, soon, especially given the machinery of the anti-gender movement, you know, how much capacity, how much money, how much resources they, they, they have, uh, trans organizations uh, cannot find them off by, by themselves. Thank you very much, uh, Bogi. What about you, Chamindra? What would be your key, key request from allies? Um, thank you, Mauro. Uh, so from allies, I would say, I would invite allies to um, reflect upon the resilience of trans communities because trans communities have always been very highly uh, resilient uh to um uh to many threats many attacks uh that uh, we have faced over many decades in different parts of the world and to admit to, to come to terms of, with the fact that um when you talk about gender identities gender expressions sex characteristics you're talking about a great deal of diversity so um, uh, we can't uh, look at things from a single issue perspective and uh, that's lived experiences um, uh, and 
uh, gender identities and expressions specific to um, certain cultural backdrops, um, the characteristics of uh, citizens are all valid. And I would say that, um, like um, Leo and Bogie mentioned as well, there is a need for strong allyship and strong global mobilization and, uh, and, and support uh, to trans communities, especially coming from intersectional feminist circles. Uh, and this, there are lots of precedents to look at in there. For example, the Black feminist tradition of North America has always uh, had a very strong component of allyship to uh, trans rights advocacy and um, developing those, um, those, those forms of allyship and um, uh, and uh, recently in this parliament of Sri Lanka, a Tamil member of parliament was uh, delivering a speech and there was a lot of um, uh, ethno-nationally hurtful hatred coming from the government side. And this gentleman said, keep on attacking us like that and you will only strengthen us. So uh, that's something that we need to uh, highlight as well. And that is where we need the support of allyship to turn this side and to make sure that all of these attacks, all of these um, uh, hollow rhetorics are, can be uh, turned to strengthen our movement building across the world. Thank you very much, uh, Termindra. I, I fully agree with the, the three of you. I will add my own request, which is for people to, to remind that there are enough human rights for everyone, that it's not the trans people get or human rights recognized and uh, you, your friends, your mom, your neighbor is going to lose something. We are portrayed that way, that we are coming to the world to steal from other people's human rights, but actually we need to work together to ensure that you know everyone has the same access to human rights. And connected with that, that we are not things, we are human beings. And the debate about if trans people are real or not, if we have the right to exist, if we have the right to take um, informed decisions about our own bodies is not a real debate. Uh, it's a conversation among other people that talk about human beings as we are things to, you know, like a glass, to decide it is a glass, it is a cup, it's... So that's not okay. That's not based on freedom of expression. That, as our panelists say today, is connected to um, pro a process to uh, dehumanize us. And that's one of the most um, dangerous situations of, of all. Um, so I, I want to thank uh, Leo, Bogi, Chamindra, also uh, Louis from, from the UK and, and B Kaminga from, from South Africa that couldn't be here doing two different uh, challenges, challenges and schedule challenge with internet connections. To all of you that join us um, today, it has been really great to be able to engage in this conversation, mixing like oral presentations with chat um, interventions. Um, our movement count on, on you, actually on all of us to survive and to thrive in the future. So we really hope to see you again engaging in this series of virtual conversations. Remember that for a conversation in Spanish, we are going uh, to meet at 6 p.m. Um, um, tomorrow, 6 p.m., sorry, Argentinian time. And GATE is having other two uh, trainings. We are not, these are not virtual conversations, but trainings on the SDGs um, a process. Tomorrow and on Thursday, you can find more information in our website. We have decided that we are not going to allow 2020 to go without, you know, having a lot of webinars at the same at the same time. So um, uh, thank you very much for everyone. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of the day, of the week and of the year. Hope to see you all of, all of you soon. Bye bye. <laughs>